This is the Very Not Normal podcast with me, your host, Frida Weisel. This episode, I'm going to dive into Unorthodox, the four-part Netflix TV show that debuted in March of 2020. Now, for those not in the know, Unorthodox tells the story of Esti, a Hasidic woman who is in a repressive, stifling environment, in a miserable marriage, and who liberates herself from this repressive environment by fleeing to Berlin, Germany, where she finds acceptance and opportunities and freedom and sunny beaches and happily ever after, etc., etc. Now, since I myself left the Satmar Hasidic community, I obviously have a lot to say on the subject, but I'm not really interested in going into the particularities, into explaining the customs that occur there and giving context for those who want to Wikipedia certain things, but rather, as always, I am interested in meta narratives, in implications of these particulars as they stand in the larger cultural context. So I'm going to go into the subject in a two part breakdown. This week, I'll talk about unorthodox as a genre, how the genre is created and what it is comprised of. And next week, I'll go into its implications what the stories that unorthodox tells mean for Hasidim, ex-Hasidim, but most importantly for the secular audience for which it's created. Stick around. The Netflix TV series Unorthodox is based on a book, a best-selling memoir by the same name, Unorthodox by Deborah Feldman. Now, Deborah Feldman grew up in Williamsburg and her story, I think, is fairly different. The adaptation is very loosely based. And her book brought the unorthodox genre, the off the derrick genre, to the public attention. Feldman writes in her own book at the very end that as she was leaving her marriage, her husband, and she was plotting a new life for herself, she realized that writing about her own Hasidic life was very popular. She said that this is her shtick. Shtick is Yiddish for a gimmick. She realized that to tell her story is to find her gimmick and to be able to sell herself. And this is something anyone who leaves the Hasidic community learns very quickly. Every single one of us will be told again and again and again that we should write a book, even though statistically it's highly unlikely that among those who leave, a hundred percent would be writers. <laughs> but when people invite us to write a book, they are not saying you're a good writer, you have unique insights, you have a perspective that is worth working out in the written form, but what they are saying is, your story seems to fit to a cliche I already know, and cliches are something that are like a brand. The more of it you have, the more of it you want. So we all want more of that, so why don't you tell the story? And the cliche it fits into is much larger than just the stories of those who leave the ultra-Orthodox community. It's the story of any person who comes from a marginalized group. And it can't just be a white bloke from Texas. It has to be someone who themselves is a person of a special status, special extra marginality. So it has to be, let's say, a woman, a person of color, etc. And that person comes from either a dysfunctional home where they weren't raised in traditional Western ways, let's say, abusive parents, homeless parents, alcoholic parents, where these parents have not prepared them for elite institutions and education and white collar work, or if that person comes from a different non-Western culture. The genre is huge. It includes all these Western subcultures. So let's say Amish country is a big one and all the related similar Christian conservative non-Western communities that reject the modern electricity and technology. It includes the Mormon subcultures that like FLDS that practice polygamy. It includes any niche religious extremism within the United States, like uh, what's it called? Jehovah's Witness and other similar subcultures like 
cults, small ones, large ones, anything that involves escaping a cult, but also escaping dysfunction. And internationally, this is also very hot. Anything that involves escaping an extremist, a communist, religious, fanatical, so-called. Uh, so it would involve leaving Muslim communities like Ayan Hirsi Ali's book, or leaving North Korea, leaving Soviet Russia, leaving any of those staple countries or staple cultures that we know are the bad and the repressive. Interestingly, when I was preparing this episode, I couldn't remember the name of the woman who wrote the story about fleeing North Korea. And her name is actually Yonami Park. I'm probably butchering it. And her book is titled In Order to Live. And it, I wouldn't recommend it. I didn't like it. But I wanted to remember what one such prototype was. So I Googled North Korea. And the very first Google suggestion after just North Korea, the country, which I'm sure people would Google a lot, was North Korea escape stories. It's your primary interest. Our primary association with North Korea is the escape story. This tells you how monumental in the American English language psyche the escape narrative is. The going from dark to light, repression to freedom, non-West to West. And mind you, I clicked on the first or second link and I saw a picture of a stage of people who look youngish in their 20s or 30s. They're sitting there by their microphones, let's say six of them, all of them looking perfectly presentable and Western and like major fools. Forgive me because they look so much like us, exorcism, sitting there just the same, eager to please before this lavishing audience that is setting us up with the questions they ask to answer whatever they want to hear and making us fit our lives into the mold of the escape story. It's just incredible to see this exact thing that I have watched play out in the off the derech, in the ex-Hasidic scene, ex-Orthodox scene play out in other cultures because we're all being squeezed into this ex-Hasidic, ex-religious, ex-fundamentalist, ex-tyranny narrative. But back to the genre, I don't begrudge anyone for loving it because I used to love it and I used to read all of it. As I said in another episode, my locus of control, and I remember the word, is internal and I like the idea of the self-made person. It appeals to me very naturally. So I used to read all of them and I read Jeanette Wall's The Glass Castle, which was adapted to film and I loved it and, and all the dysfunctional, terrible memoirs. But then I saw it a little more up close and that started to unravel the promise for me. It started to bring into question what these stories really tell and how connected to reality they are versus mythology. So when Tara Westover's book Educated became lauded as this tremendous success story, I wasn't sold. I was a lot more cynical and critical of this type of story. So Tara Westover's book, Educated, is in short a story of dysfunction. Her father was this prepper who lived sort of off the grid and involved the children in keeping the property, taking care of the property at home, and the children had multiple injuries. Anyway, in the end, Tara triumphantly left and became a student, I think, in Cambridge or Oxford, somewhere in England. Voila, very happy. It's the perfect story. You can cry now, joyful tears. Now, it wasn't surprising to me that Bill Gates swooned over the book because this is just the kind of story that would reconfirm his worldview as well as Obama's, which is all part of the progressive schema, the techno-utopian mindset that I went into more detail in the previous episode where I talked about instrumental reason and the problems with that. Now, back to Deborah Feldman's book. Feldman's book is a very poorly written example of this, and many of them are very poorly written because they are not about the writing really, and they're not about the coherence. And I would say that the problems with the writing are almost a compliment because it makes it more raw, even if that rawness exposes something that I think is a sociopathy of the author, a kind of callousness to everyone and a framing herself perpetually as a victim. Whereas stories like Tara Westover's, which are filled with fluffy, mushy, fancy language, things that sound profound but actually mean nothing, 
are much more dangerous because they're much more likely to deceive and to create a mirage for the audience that the audience cannot see through. Now, the show Unorthodox is even worse than all of this. It is lazy. It doesn't even make you sit there for a few hours and read it. It is a film adaptation that gives the audience zero credit. It absolutely disrespects the intelligence of the audience. Whereas Deborah Feldman knew her source material from personal life, the showrunners of this film, of Unorthodox, or better yet, of this series, knew nothing. They were not from the religious community. They were from freaking Germany. And they hired a cast from Israel. This is a community with so much nuance that I don't know how anyone would have the audacity to tell the story of something and purport to be able to do so authentically when they are so, so far removed from even touching the iceberg of understanding. It's just mind-blowing. I had a bit of a view of the making of because, of course, it's a small incestuous community here and as a matter of fact if you watch the show there's an end of bonus material a little segment where they talk about the making of and they work up the authenticity it's all baloney they talk about making the strimals which anyone who's seen a strimal can see are terrible but they brag about how they all worked so hard to make a strimal which just speaks by the way to what the learning curve is if it took them so much to pull off a bad strimal it looks ridiculous. It sinks on the head. But if you take someone from the community who's the biggest ignoramus, is still going to be able to pull off a strimal. You just cannot replace knowledge from intimately living something with hiring someone for a few aggression to tell you this and that. It's, it's incredibly audacious that these showrunners still go and light our faces and pretend that they actually put in effort when it was really just a bit of toying with fun. Oh, we're having fun. They're toying with it as much as I am toying with audio, learning how to edit audio. So my own involvement with the show was not much, although I was hoping for more, but maybe that <laughs> I was spared a horrible experience because I've been on sets, I've seen the shoots, and it's really, really cringy to watch the making of and the butchering of our stories. But you'll hear in the bonus series, among the things they say, that they did their research but going for two days to New York and they took a tour with a woman from the Sotmar community, an ex Sotmar woman. And that is yours truly. I did give them a tour and I showed them around. And to be frank, I could see straight away that they were like sniggering teenagers who had found everything so funny. I'm extremely sensitive to people's receptiveness to the Hasidic community. Because as someone who left and as someone who makes my living, usually, now I'm broke, um, by working in this community, it's a very ethical gray line. And I don't feel comfortable giving tours if people don't come with a view that everyone is human and we are not here to see ourselves as superior humans, but to understand complex meta histories and unique nuances of cultures and if people come on my tour and like ha ha they look funny then i am very uncomfortable i feel like i'm going to rip off my microphone and leave and they were one of those customers they were six it was a freezing freezing winter day we had other customers as well whom they completely ignored at the very end one of the netflix bigwigs joined us and they were all lapsing into german even though we had other people it was not it was not my best experience but it was very clear to me that they were not respecting the subject that they had found here this escape story and they knew that they had landed on hot sellable material and that they were going to sell it and they sold it they sold it it won some award i don't know what it won but it is so embarrassing that it even won something but then again i just read that boss baby was nominated for i believe an oscar so i mean <laughs> what is there to say it's embarrassing for everyone and everything but the show just checked off like a checklist of voyeuristic moments the arranged marriage, the couple meeting, the looking at the couple, the sex education class, the ritual bath. You had to see her naked completely. You had to see the wedding night, the couple's intimate drama. You had to see the family and, of course, the mentions of the Holocaust. It wouldn't be complete without sensational, dramatized Holocaust 
hovering over everything as if everyone is walking around with the Holocaust. I happen to believe that the Holocaust is extremely important to understanding the Hasidic community today because it's one of those moments of shock from which a lot of trauma and historical narrative is driven. Shock can drive a lot of future events like 9-11 has driven so many different things. It, it has reshaped the entire course of history or it has at least vastly shaped the entire course of history. And this is what the Holocaust has done for Hasidim. But just as with 9-11, we don't go around consciously referencing it day and night, this shaping is subconscious. It's not heavy-handed hanging over people's heads and on their lips all the time. It is only shaping a worldview often quietly and subconsciously. But in unorthodox, where everything is ham-fisted and just so ridiculous, this of course hangs over everything. Now, on top of this, apparently the showrunners didn't think that this was bad enough and that people could stick around, pay attention for this. They added a whole subplot, which isn't in the book, in which two men, Esty's husband and some other guy, are sent by the Rebbe, of all things, this stiff, bizarre, robotic-like Rebbe, declares that the husband must at once be transmitted to Germany of all places to, to run after his wife and bring her back. Okay. And this, what ensues is something like an escape mafioso scene with guns and threats and inviting Esty to commit suicide. And there are prostitutes and there's even a scene with mysticism and there's a church. There's, it's absolutely what the hell? I don't know. I mean, it's one thing if it's a comedy like The Mad Adventures of Rabbi Jacob, which is a French film. And it tells the story of some criminal who dresses up of a rabbi and goes through one mishap after another as he struggles to imitate a Rebbe. But this, this is supposed to be serious. This is supposed to be profound. And this got glowing reviews from our so-called critics. And when I criticized it, I thought it was so bad that it was criticizing itself. And I was just pointing out, I was just giving a vocabulary for the criticism. But when I criticized it, I got an onslaught of emails. I never, ever got anything like that number of emails. Just a hundred by the hour of people telling me, if you think the community is so great, why did you leave? The support I got was from the community, which I don't really trust. And the criticism I got were from all of these so-called feminists who were like, you're ruining our great illusion. Shut the hell up, go back to your hole. The New Yorker even called me out in their review. It's titled Unorthodox Reviewed, A Young Woman's Remarkable Flight from Hasidic Williamsburg. And it's written by Rachel Saimi. I believe it's Saimi or Sim. Okay, here goes. She's writing about Deborah Feldman, the author of the book, being consulted by the showrunners to quote, ensure that their depiction of the insular Hasidic community was as accurate as possible. Whether they fully succeeded is a matter of debate. Frida Weisel, a former member of the Satmar sect, wrote an op-ed in the forward complaining that the show makes Hasidic women look as humorless as foreign Disney witches in odd costumes. <laughs> Dot end quote. I don't remember writing that. I need to contextualize. Saimi herself lives in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is right north, walking distance a few minutes from Williamsburg. But she said that the Hasidic community, despite that, is completely foreign to her, which is very common. A lot of people who live in the neighborhood have absolutely no idea about their neighbors. It's like different worlds for both sides. So despite not knowing the community and despite hearing what I had to say, she goes on then to say, but the scenes of unorthodox that take place in Williamsburg and largely in Yiddish pay unhurried and compelling attention to the rituals of Hasidic life. End quote. Okay. On its face, this type of writing sounds like, yeah, it's unhurried, compelling words, words is profound. But what is she essentially saying? She's saying that authenticity doesn't matter. What matters is if you hover, if you linger, if you stay. L let's try an experiment. Let's imagine the same type of thinking in something Simon would understand. Gender. 
let's say we have men who don't know anything about women and this has happened many times in the history of the arts where these men will write about women and the intimate lives of women without having any idea about what it's like to be a woman and they project their own ideas about women on women so they will write she walked boobily down the stairs this is a trope among frustrated writers who make fun of men who will think that women are busy looking at their breasts in the mirror all day and are busy staring at themselves in the eyes of the male writers and if we are to take Siamese criteria for what makes good writing about the other then in this scenario in the sexist scenario the male writers who linger on the exoticization of women by paying unhurried and compelling attention on the woman's curves and buttocks are actually doing something magnificent <laughs> which of course they are not they are projecting on women their own ideas and experiences and then framing that as the inner lives of women and it is so much worse when they do that if they claim that they are doing so with intimate knowledge so what you spoke to your wife for five minutes you then go with that and you write about the women without focusing on sensitivity on empathy and really understanding on really caring about your subject and caring about understanding their inner lives on removing your own biases and getting into their world then what you're writing is men writing women which is a reddit and it's a lot of funny examples of terrible writing and terrible storytelling that is poison because it reaffirms and reperpetuates stereotypes and assumptions about the other instead of at least at the very least leave it alone let it stay some kind of foggy idea in the back of your mind it's better to just have some kind of vague knowledge because then at least you know that you don't know rather than to like Simi, you think you know you tell yourself you know and you like to know what you know what you know makes you feel good it's like with this fantasy genre of television shows in some ways unorthodox and other exotic cultures falls into this category it's exotic you speak a different language it has all of these strange costumes that awaken you to the fun and the new while also being the old also being the familiar also being the kind of gratifying feel good And I would say the reason that the public doesn't care if something is authentic has to do with the genre. It doesn't matter to the genre if it's authentic. What the genre does is not deliver insight. It does not break stereotypes. It does not seek to transmit understanding of the other. We say that in fiction, we can expand our empathy by walking the mile in other people's shoes, you know, understanding experiences of someone who is completely distant from you. So this is why it's worth it for us to read different sex, different culture, different perspectives. But if those different perspectives are actually just projections of our own, then of course it does the very opposite. And this does the very opposite because it's not here to increase empathy. It's here to fit itself into a trope. And that trope cannot coexist with empathy that trope will be useless if it really challenged us it will not be feel good to tell the story of someone leaving and the complications and the challenges and the pain and the times that they are very unheroic is not feel good and in fact it could often be very tragic so we cannot afford for the genre's sake to go anywhere near authenticity because if we would understand the complexities, the gray areas, the kind of exchanges that people make in order for them to get their freedom. And oftentimes the buckus, the, the fairy tales that they themselves buy into, as I did, when they leave and that is a part of their stories. It's not attractive to hear about my very naive ideas about what I was going in for and that I had come around to seeing that as being something like duped. 
So authenticity doesn't fit with the rags to riches, coming of age, extremist liberation genre. In order for the genre to work, you have to not be authentic. Yet, in order for it to work, in order for the exotic to be based on a true life story, you also have to say that it is authentic. So you dabble a little. You hire yes men who are going to consult on your stage and are going to say everything you do is great. That shaitel that sits on the head like a mop, perfect. That strimal that sinks over the eyes, beautiful. That bakisha, the stomach is exploding out of, wow. Couldn't be more authentic. There's a whole underlying dynamic that's going on that is completely ignored in the interchange between those from the community, those among us who are translating to outsiders and are beholden to these outsiders for their gracious employ. So we can only give very limited instruction. If we give too much, we lose the opportunity. And on the other hand, the outsiders are not even informed enough to understand. Just to give you an example, the Yiddish on the show is terrible. The New Yorker writer, Rachel Simon, can just take the audio track of the show, go to Williamsburg, <laughs> and have people listen to it and see what they say. I don't know that people would even understand much of it because these actors are from Israel. Their language, spoken language, is Hebrew. Hebrew is a completely different language family from Yiddish. Yiddish is much closer to German. We would probably have more luck with a German actor speaking Yiddish than with the Israelis, who, even those who tried their best, could just not pull it off. And the end result is that no matter how much you try from the community, transmitting this language to outsiders is a, pretty much a very difficult task. Now, should we nitpick? Should we laugh at everything? Should we say everything is wrong? No, I don't think so. To me, it doesn't bother me if someone writes about the other and they make mistakes. It's fine, but where's their heart? What are they trying to do? Are they trying to fit other people's lives into a genre that will sell like hotcakes and promote their own selfish careers while ignoring the actual experiences of those whose stories they're telling? Or are you trying your very, very best and because this is so far and you're making mistakes, I make mistakes. I got a bunch of messages from people that I mispronounced or completely butchered a word in my first episode, which I thought maybe I'm not remembering it correctly. But of course, we all, even those among us in the community, whenever we work on something, ask so much of each other, which is natural. I don't have a problem with not knowing at all. And I don't have a problem with mistakes either. You cannot know a lot of things and you can make a lot of mistakes and still at the core capture an authenticity. And that authenticity is valuable because it challenges us. It creates insight. It leaves us thinking. The show Shtisel, which is an Israeli TV series that doesn't tell the trope, but rather follows the lives of a group of Israeli Haredim, which is sort of the name in Israel for Hasidim, is really an example of a show that, I don't know, do they make mistakes? Do some of their storylines have to be far-fetched in order to create a plot? Of course, but it still works because you can tell that they care. You can tell on these little inside jokes. You can tell that instead of exoticizing the big cliched moments that feel so generalized that everyone can recognize it, but no one can feel it. They have these little moments that trans fat in the supermarket. The guy is super angry and he buys cookies with trans fat. It leaves you this feeling of intimacy. It leaves you this feeling that the creators are not only talking to the secular audience, but also to the inside audience. They have in mind that the insiders are listening and they care to tell to the insiders a story that the insiders will hear and enjoy or criticize or come down extremely harshly or nitpick. Insiders are a very tough audience. I always, always, always get picked on in a way that shows on the outside wouldn't get. 
the standards are very high for those who tell authentic or try authenticity. But the very act of trying to speak to insiders forces you to be careful, to be thoughtful. You cannot stand in front of a group of men and women and project your narratives of women in which women are completely exoticized. And the same goes for when writers care enough about their subject matter to actually think of them as part of their audience. And to think of them as part of their audience requires letting go of the cliche of the genre. It means stepping outside of that. And this is something that Unorthodox most certainly was not up for. enjoyed this episode of the Very Not Normal podcast with me, Frida Weisel. If you liked it, please consider spreading the word, liking, subscribing, sharing. You can also leave me feedback by going to my anchor.fm page. There is a link in the episode description of how to get to it. I'm also including in the episode description links to other sources I'm mentioning in the podcast so you can do your further deep dives. If you would like to, you can also check out my other work at FridaWeisel.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.